And let me once again officially welcome everybody to today's online event, Entrepreneurship and Urban, Su Urban Success, Toward a Policy Consensus. Today's event is sponsored by the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation and the Government Innovators Network. And I'd like to turn things over to the moderator for today's event, Stephen Goldsmith, who is the Director of the Innovations in American Government Program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Jim, and uh, thanks for your help with this uh, discussion. Um, we have a, had a great interest in this particular topic, and we're uh, pleased to uh, join in hosting it. And I know I certainly, as a mayor, uh, as all mayors in the U.S., uh, economic development officials and state officials try to figure out the right strategies to create jobs and wealth and investment in a community. And there are only so many uh, incentives one can use and how to use those correctly and fairly so as to create new opportunities rather than just rearranging the existing opportunities. Uh, there are tough issues about how to choose winners over losers, whether they're inside industries or new industries are all very problematic. And, uh, and certainly, uh, both in uh, my city, Indianapolis, and I was mayor and elsewhere, you make good decisions and you make bad decisions. But there, it seems like there's a uh, increasing uh, attention to uh, what are better ways to attract economic development and growth other than just uh, chasing smokestacks and, and offering large incentives uh, that may not uh, produce that much value. And so the, the whole issue of entrepreneurship and, and how to create an environment that's conducive uh, to it uh, is a terrifically important issue. So we're uh, really pleased to have um, uh, nationally recognized panelists today talking to us about this issue. Uh, some uh, or a recent uh, publication by uh, two of them, and uh, uh, a national participation by the third. So let me let me kick off the discussion by uh, uh, saying that our panelists will be the following: uh, Bob Lycan, Vice President of Research and Policy at the Kaufman Foundation, uh, a very active uh, uh, policy expert uh, nationally and with respect to state and local. Activities will be uh, with us uh, and presenting first. Uh, Ed Glazer, a, a colleague of mine at the Harvard's Kennedy School, the director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government, uh, a, um, a well uh, read uh, author of many insightful uh, articles about uh, cities and their regional growth, uh, will participate. And then Jeff Finkel, uh, who's president and CEO of the International Economic Development Council. Uh, perhaps the leading um, uh, expert and advocate of, uh, of smart economic development policies nationally will will uh, present as well. So after this, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Bob to start and the other two to follow on. And when Jeff's finished, um, I'll sort through your uh, electronic three by five cards and we'll, and we'll carry on a discussion. So with that, uh, Bob. Uh, thanks a lot, Steve. Um, let me just give you a quick introduction to why we wrote this document. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Kauffman Foundation, uh, we are probably the largest foundation in the world whose main mission is to promote uh, understanding of entrepreneurship. Uh, and a lot of our activities are focused on private sector uh, entrepreneurship, but increasingly we've gotten involved in uh, public policy. About a year and a half ago, we issued a roadmap, something called a Roadmap for an Entrepreneurial Economy, which you can find on our website, which is at Kaufman.org, uh, K-A-U-F-F-M-A-N.org. And what that, web, and what that um, a roadmap does, it gives uh, sort of a, a, a cook's tour of a lot of the policy work that we have funded uh, that relates to federal policy that would affect uh, entrepreneurship. And uh, there have been a number of writings of the foundation which have linked entrepreneurship to economic growth. Uh, and so we felt it was appropriate to start at the federal level. Well, to make a long story short, after we released the federal document, um, we got um, a lot of inquiries uh, from people like those of you on a phone call, from reporters and so forth, who would say, well, what would you tell state and local governments to do? Because frankly, that's where most of the action is not the federal level. And so what we did about a year ago is that we convened about 10 of the leading urban economists uh, in the country. Um, and uh, we asked Ed Glazer, who's going to follow me next, to help organize that effort. And we met at, at the Kennedy School. Um, and we spent about a day going through uh, what 
sort of the consensus views of the academic community would be. And over the next, I don't know, six or eight months, we worked on a document which is the result that you see today, this, uh, this document on urban um, entrepreneurship. And um, uh, that document, I think, represents uh, the consensus views of not just only the 10 people who were involved in the project, but I would assert a, a somewhat broader group. I'm not going to claim that every urban economist agrees with everything in the, in the document, but I think what you see here is um, a fair compilation of what urban economists would tell cities today um, about how to promote growth. So with that introduction, let me just go to a few slides before we go over to Ed. Um, we start the document by noting uh, three broad schools for uh, how one views uh, local or regional growth. Um, uh, one thought is that it's all luck um, and that uh, you really can't do much. Um, and, uh, you know, everyone wants to be the next Silicon Valley, but the reality is if you do the literature uh, search on how Silicon Valley got started, uh, you'll see, of course, uh, the Hewlett Packard and the Intel story. And that one of the best uh, recountings of Silicon Valley is by Gordon Moore, who, who has written that it was largely luck. It was luck that he got started. It was luck that um, his group um, uh, split off um, uh, from a previous enterprise. They formed Fairchild Camera, which eventually became Intel. Uh, they split off from Bardeen, and uh, the rest is history. Um, it was semi-luck that Hewlett and Packard got started there. Uh, there's, of course, been a lot been written about the role of Stanford University, and it's true that a lot of Stanford alums helped uh, Silicon Valley companies grow, but the reality is it got started by luck. And if you look around at other high-tech centers in the country, I think you'd have to say the same thing. In fact, I think from my own personal vantage point, one of the only high-tech centers in the country that got started out of deliberate planning would probably be Research Triangle Park, where you had um, a deliberate efforts to get EPA and IBM involved, and the rest is history there. But if you look at San Diego, Seattle, Austin, um, Albuquerque, you name it, you go around the country, a lot of it was luck. Um, so the second school of thought is, well, it may be luck, but there are certain things you can do that will enhance the chances that luck will strike. Um, and so we call this the build it and they will come model. The idea here is if you get the basics right, you you do the right things on infrastructure, on education, safety, and amenities. You're going to hear more about that from, from Ed in a minute. But if you do that, then basically you can increase the odds that you'll get a Silicon Valley kind of uh, um, uh, experiment that will uh, flower, before you, uh, uh, flower before you. And um, so that's the second school of thought. The third school is uh, something that Steve referred to in his opening remarks, and that's target intervention. Uh, it can be called smokestack chasing. It, could be called firm chasing, but the idea here is that you use specific subsidies, regulatory preferences, or whatever to, in effect, bribe a firm or a um, or a plant to open in your in, in your area. Uh, you have ribbon cutting ceremonies, and hopefully you get job growth. And uh, this, of course, is a strategy which is well known to many cities. Uh, we are somewhat, if not outright, critical of this approach in the uh, paper uh, for at least two reasons. One is um, uh, you can buy somebody to come to your location, but that doesn't guarantee they'll stay bought. And a uh, perfect example of that is you can just see in the primary campaign for presidents, uh, all, you know, the candidates running around Ohio, um, all worried about what had happened to Ohio with plants leaving Ohio. Uh, plants move, and by the way, they don't just have to move to Mexico. They can move to Georgia or Texas or Mississippi or Alabama. Uh, but uh, we all know that plants are footloose. That's the first problem with trying to buy them. And the second problem is that from a national point of view, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, all you're doing is bidding against other cities or increasingly against other countries. And um, uh, if all you're doing is moving the growth around to the, uh, from one place to the, uh, to the other in the country, this is not doing the country any, any, any good, and, and it's impoverishing you at the same time. So to make a long story short, we therefore uh, take the view in this piece that uh, the really the best approach for the country and also from the vantage point of individual city or region is to promote entrepreneurship. Um, because if you do that and the formation of new firms, that's a win-win. That doesn't hurt another city if you happen to spawn the next Silicon Valley kind of growth company. Um, and Ed will show you some evidence, in fact, that there's a linkage between entrepreneurial formation and uh, regional growth. 
let me get, show you one other slide, and then we'll turn over to Ed. Um, there are a number of tests that you can apply when you think about trying to do this, and we'll give you some concrete policy advice at the end. But those are the those are some of the four basic things. I want to highlight the last one, and the last one is that one of the things that seems to be highly correlated with growth um, and entrepreneurship in any area, and that is the ability to attract college-educated young people. If you can do that, um, uh, you'll get the jobs, uh, you'll get the firms, um, and you'll get um, you get the kind of entrepreneurial growth that we call for. So with that introduction, let me turn it over uh, to Ed, and he will show you just a snapshot of some of the empirical evidence that, while not definitive, at least lends support to the thesis that I've outlined. Ed? Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you all for being here, here today. I, I want to start with a uh, broad historical uh, perspective. If uh, we go back to 1975, um, the, the remarkable thing is that basically all of this nation's older, colder cities uh, were in trouble. Whether or not you were in Boston or Buffalo, whether or not you were in New York or in Detroit, every one of the older, colder cities had been had been hit by major historical trends, which seemed to uh, augur an unending time of urban of urban decline. The last 30 years have seen a remarkable divergence of uh, those older, colder places. Um, some of those cities, like Detroit, uh, like Cleveland, like Buffalo, still look like uh, very troubled urban areas. Other places, New York, Boston, Minneapolis, look, uh, if not as successful as coastal California, uh, at least far more successful than they did uh, 30 years ago. Um, this type of diversity uh, is at least one reason to think about what policies can be undertaken to make some cities uh, more successful. If there's one variable that explains the success of those older, colder cities, it's uh, the skills of the people living in those cities. What you're looking at here is the relationship between population growth in the 1990s and the share of the population uh, that had a college degree as of 1990, uh, you'll notice that about half the variation can actually be explained by share of the population with college degrees. Um, the, um, the, the skilled places have done well. Uh, the less skilled places have, have done poorly. Uh, and that, that basic fact underlies a story of entrepreneurship and regeneration uh, in these colder places. What's happened in um, places like Minneapolis and, and Boston has been a remarkable outpouring of skilled people innovating in ways that have turned their, uh, turned their cities around. And one way to think about this is that globalization and new technologies have really reshaped the world. But uh, they've reshaped the world in a way that is not uniformly bad for cities and not uniformly bad for American cities. So while competition with Japan, with Korea, uh, proved to be incredibly difficult for the old, large firms, Detroit, uh, the goods, the goods makers, and relatively static industries. That same globalization, that same onslaught of new technology, has proved to be an incredible boon to those firms and those entrepreneurs who have been smart and savvy and innovative enough to figure out how to exploit the new opportunities. In some sense, the way to think about this is while being an entrepreneur in 1920 pretty much meant thinking about ways in which you could be more productive within your city. Um, being an entrepreneur in 2007 uh, means that you're you know, figuring out ways to be smart on a global stage. And that meant that, in fact, that the returns to entrepreneurship have gone up and up uh, with, global, with globalization and with uh, with new technologies. The next slide you're looking at is the relationship between skills and increases in income across metropolitan areas. The places that had more initial skills have gotten, uh, have gotten much, uh, much richer. Uh, another way to think about this is what globalization and new technologies have done is they've increased the returns to being smart. Uh, obviously, that's you know, part of being an entrepreneur is you're, you're being smart. You're figuring out a new way uh, to produce something or a new way to, to provide a new, a new product. And you get smart fundamentally by hanging around smart people. 
and this is basically what the highly skilled entrepreneurial cities uh, of, of the U.S. are good at doing. It's fundamentally what Silicon Valley is good at doing. It's providing a, a cluster of skills that then become self-reinforcing because one person's smart idea then moves to the next person that creates a virtuous cycle of uh, development, innovation, uh, and change. Uh, a final trend that, that goes along with this has been the remarkable tendency of skilled people to move around other skilled people. What you're looking at on this graph is the relationship between the growth in the share of the population with college degrees and between 1990 and 2000 and the initial share of the population with college degrees. Places that started off more skilled have become, uh, have become more skilled over time. And that's reflecting the desire that highly skilled people have to be around others. It's also reflecting the fact that entrepreneurs who are skilled and productive today increasingly innovate in ways that employ other skilled workers. A simple comparison of Henry Ford and, and Bill Gates, for example, makes that quite clear. While Henry Ford innovated in a way that employed literally hundreds of thousands of less skilled workers uh, in the River Rouge plant and in other Ford plants, Bill Gates innovates in a way that uh, by and large employs very talented software uh, engineers. This tendency of skilled people to employ other skilled people is part of this, you know, these clusters of, of seems like these clusters of skills that are, are the most successful places in today's, in today's world. That then takes us to uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, and, and city success. These skilled places, once you get beyond the sort of you know, the census figures, what you see is, is a remarkable sort of cauldron of innovation and entrepreneurship of, of small firms working on each other, of, of entrepreneurs working on each other. For example, a, we can think about perhaps the most impressive of all the urban turnarounds, that of New York City, uh, which is really driven by one massive industrial cluster, financial services. Financial services and its turnaround since the 1960s is a story of entrepreneurs playing off each other, starting off with a few entrepreneurs figuring out how to, how to price risk efficiently, moving towards the young Mike Milken selling riskier assets and creating the junk bond industry, moving to Henry Kravis and using those, those riskier assets to restructure corporate America, moving to Lou Ranieri being entrepreneurial and, and selling mortgage-backed securities, moving towards... Uh, uh, moving towards Michael Bloomberg and selling the data that the, that the new appetite for processing risk, for understanding risk, and, and creates. This is sort of a chain of smart entrepreneur, entrepreneurs working on each other. And um, certainly, the, there is a strong relationship that I'll show you in a second uh, between skills and successful entrepreneurship. Um, I'm not going to show you, but it, it's also a fact that, that skilled entrepreneurs are more likely to heal, hire other uh, uh, skilled workers, and that's, that's actually what's driving a lot of these older, colder, more skilled cities uh, and the turnaround. What you're seeing here is the relationship between one of the, the few, you know, few measures of, of individual entrepreneurship we have, the self-employment rate, uh, and education. And, and the bottom uh, dotted line just shows you the overall self-employment rate and uh, by education. What you can see is sort of a mildly upward sloping graph moving from somewhere around 4% for people with less than high school degrees to about 7% for those people with college degrees or higher. So any, any self-employment rate that you look at, you see, you see more uh, entrepreneurship uh, for more educated people. But let's say we just restricted ourselves to those entrepreneurs who are earning more than $110,000 a year, those, those entrepreneurs who are successful enough uh, to be earning material rewards. There you see really a huge gap uh, between um, the share of people who are uh, more skilled and the people who are less skilled. Um, really, sort of the, the fundamental source of successful entrepreneurs are um, are more skilled, are more skilled workers. Um, another fact that co that goes along with this view that innovation and entrepreneurship are related to, to economic success at the city level is the relationship between growth and patenting and income growth which is what you see in the next in the next figure. This is the change in patenting activities from 1990 to 2000 and the increase in income at the metropolitan area level over that same time period. Um, there's, a, there's a quite strong tendency of places that have become more innovative uh, to also become uh, richer. Um, and the next slide um, looks at what I think is probably a better measure of entrepreneurship at the city level than self-employment rates which is the average firm size within a metropolitan area, areas that have lots of small firms, 
are uh, almost by definition more entrepreneurial. And what you're looking here is across metropolitan areas the relationship between average firm size and the self-employment rate. Uh, so these two measures, both of them coarse, both of them imperfect, uh, uh, do appear to be getting at least at something uh, of the same thing. And, and uh, I think that that something is, is, uh, is, is entrepreneurship. Um, if you then take average firm size, again, which I think is the best city level measure of entrepreneurship we have, and then relate it to, say, employment growth. So here I have average firm size from county business data in 1977, uh, then looking at employment growth between 1977 and 2000. What you see is that the places that had the smallest firms uh, had by far the most robust employment growth. Um, the places with large, older smokestack firms were slow. The places with um, lots of small, uh, little firms grew much more quickly. Again, uh, pushing along this, this view that, that small firm entrepreneurship is really the linchpin of economic success for, uh, for modern cities. The self-employment rate also positively predicts urban success. That's in the next uh, graph. But it's, much, it's a much weaker variable, uh, probably because it's a much coarser variable in terms of predicting, uh, of, of actually capturing what we think is, is important in entrepreneurship. Which then takes me back to where uh, Bob was in terms of thinking about what policies would be important if you think that skilled entrepreneurship, the skilled entrepreneurship is, is critical. Then what should government do to make that happen? Is the right approach a completely less fair approach, or is it one that targets particular industries, or is it something in the middle? I think the starting point needs to be that innovative success entrepreneurship is extraordinarily difficult to predict. And governments are actually not very good at this. I mean, at best, venture capitalists can do a reasonable job, but the skills of, of venture capitalists are very different from the skills of most, most local governments. Perhaps the most famous example we have of a government agency filled with the smartest people in its country who are in the business of trying to pick winners is Japan, Japan's Ministry of International Trade and, and Industry, um, which was in the business of, of funding uh, new innovation. During the boom, Japanese boom, it was uh, alleged that MIDI uh, played a major role in supporting Japanese innovation. But when uh, economists, particularly David Weinstein, looked at, uh, looked at the track record of MIDI, he found that it was an unmitigated disaster, that MIDI un uh, uniformly tended to pick losers uh, rather than winners in terms of the things that they uh, predicted. Uh, in terms of the things that they bet on. So I, I think it's, it's important to um, move away from the hubris that would lead you to think that you can actually predict which particular firms and which particular uh, industries are going to do well. And I think the track record of trying to micromanage uh, industrial success is very, very poor. And Bob alluded to the you know, vast track record of, of uh, cities in, in Ohio trying to engage in various forms of local industrial policy to try and keep uh, manufacturing firms in the area, and that, that's not a particularly helpful one. Let me just make it clear that we academics are no better than any, anyone else. As my predecessors at, at Harvard uh, made a number of very strong statements that unless the area built up and, and uh, expanded Cambridge's candy industry, Cambridge was finished. This was back in the 60s and 70s when Cambridge was still something of a declining candy town. Needless to say, if Cambridge had taxed all of its nascent technology firms, to keep its candy industry going, uh, the city would have been uh, a disaster. So I think uh, we have a, a fair amount of, of evidence suggesting that attempting to micromanage, attempting to cherry pick particular firms is really not a good way to go. That pushes us towards uh, a second uh, set of strategies. Um, and I don't think the right answer on this is, is something that can be called laissez-faire, but it's, it's much more oriented towards creating a, you know, uh, creating a, a good fertile field, uh, building it and letting it come. And I think the, the right strategy here is to create a quality of life and an urban uh, society where skilled entrepreneurial people actually want to live. And this means you know, keeping crime down. This means um, having good schools. This means having fast commutes. Uh, engaging in smart quality of life strategies which will make the area more pleasant. This is an area in which I've occasionally crossed uh, swords with Richard Florida, another, another uh, urban scholar, who has also taken the view that actually attracting smart, innovative people is the place for cities to succeed. But where Richard tends to see, uh, uh, think of smart entrepreneurial people as being 28-year-olds uh, wearing black turtlenecks and hanging out in coffee shops, uh, I think I, I'm more uh, disposed towards um, thinking, thinking of entrepreneurs as 40-somethings who are 
you know, have, have advanced degrees and, and, you know, families and care, caring about fast commutes and, and good schools, uh, at least as much as coffee houses. Um, there are, of course, other policies which are about attracting and uh, keeping uh, potential entrepreneurs, keeping taxes uh, limited, except insofar as those taxes are, are being used for necessary quality of life investments, keeping redistribution limited. And I think this is, a, this is an important point, as much as many of us may wish to you know, solve the social inequities within America, it, this is a very hard thing for localities to do on their own. Because if a locality decides to set up its own little welfare state, it inevitably does so on the backs of firms and richer people, which just induces them to leave. Um, so unfortunately, that creates you know, profound limits on what localities can do to right those social wrongs, at least if they want to keep uh, smart entrepreneurial people within their, their cities. I think that there's um, more that localities can do in terms of the build as may will come uh, strategy. There's, there's a need to eliminate roadblocks to innovation. Um, lots of places have very stringent regulations that make it very hard for new firms to start up. Regulation in general tends to um, be more costly for smaller firms that don't have large legal departments that can readily enable them to deal with the cost of regulation. So uh, onerous regulations tend to be particularly painful on, on small firms rather than big firms, and that's a reason to be wary about them. We, you should be particularly wary, of course, of those regulations that are particularly favored by large firms, which then use those regulations to clamp down on their more entrepreneurial uh, competitors. And finally, I think uh, the business of city governments are to create infrastructure for success, and that's a combination of legal and physical infrastructure, uh, and it's a combination of human and, and, um, and physical capital. So legal infrastructure, we throw out the idea of uh, not um, accepting non-compete clauses, as California, for example, does not, which makes it difficult for firms to bind uh, prospective workers uh, to them and stop the flow of ideas from firm to firm. Um, on top of that, there, there's certainly a need for, for investment in, in other physical uh, forms of infrastructure which are used by firms as well. So let me, let me end that and say that we're, well, what I think we're proposing, the reason why this got a fair amount of acceptance from a wide range of the people that we gathered together, was a middle-of-the-road policy that neither favors the sort of very aggressive micromanaging of entrepreneurship, the very, the very extensive smoke stack chasing, but nor does it suggest that there is no role for government either. There's an important role for government to play in terms of boosting quality of life, in terms of increasing the quality of education, in terms of creating the legal infrastructure that makes entrepreneurship easier. But it's limited to that and shouldn't go so far as to actually trying to think that you can play entrepreneur yourself. And I'll end with, I'll end with that and pass it on over back to Steve. So, um, Jeff, you want to uh, kind of react from the uh, uh, many economic development directors that you, you uh, touch with uh, each day about these uh, ideas? Uh, I do. And um, let, let me make an, an observation, maybe more for the panel. Uh, I've gone through the attendee list, and I uh, recognize a number of communities that's, that are uh, participating in this session. And we have people from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, Buffalo, New York, Atlanta, Georgia, Orlando, Florida, Western Massachusetts, New Orleans, Portland, Oregon, Southeastern Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, Washington, D.C., among others, and, and many of them represented at the economic development director level. So um, that shows you, I think, uh, the interest uh, that uh, many communities have of, of having a diversified economic development strategy. Um, there, there may be some people on the phone that do not know who IEDC uh, is, and we are the membership organization of people who work in the field of economic development. Uh, during this coming year, and we've just finished doing our strategic plan, uh, we are uh, focused on three major uh, categories of activity, um, entrepreneurship, sustainability and globalization. And, and frankly, the issue of globalization almost led us to the issue of entrepreneurship. As Bob said at the beginning, um, many companies are fleet of foot. Uh, we find that our Fortune 500s or Fortune 1000, uh, they are there for a period of time, but uh, they also are uh, likely to leave. They are likely to uh, uh, make decisions that are in the uh, the best interest to their bottom line, and that in many cases has meant uh, moving to Indonesia, China, India, et cetera. 
And so many of an economic developer has uh, tried to figure out the answer to the question, who can you rely upon in terms of uh, the mainstay of your local economy? And I, and I think what has been obvious to many is that you can, you're counting on for your local leadership, local entrepreneurs. You're looking on for uh, growth in current investment, your local entrepreneurs. You're looking for job growth from your local entrepreneurs. And when you're trying to build um, your uh, uh, civic leadership, your charitable uh, leadership, and even supporting your economic development programs, you're looking to, to, to your local entrepreneurship. I uh, tend to, um, you know, I, I, I hear what uh, um, Ed said before me, and, and frankly, not all cities are going to be great places to live. And even those cities that aren't great places to live cannot uh, improve their quality of life to be a Boulder, Colorado, or a, a Bethesda, Maryland. Many of them are leading in growing entrepreneurs as well. A few years back, uh, IEDC was involved in helping the Levi Strauss Foundation uh, deal with some of the communities where they were closing their gene facilities. As, uh, many of you may know Levi's was the last of the major gene uh, companies to um, uh, close their U.S.-based facilities. Well, if anybody goes to the September 26, 2007 uh, New York Times, you're going to find there's a reemergence of gene manufacturing in the United States. Not necessarily high technology, um, not necessarily uh, uh, a Silicon Valley type of, uh, of growth, but they are occurring in a number of places um, uh, that are not necessarily high quality of places, but all of a sudden we are competitive in certain uh, places in the garment manufacturing business, and many of us would have given that uh, particularly up for debt. Uh, if you look at Reading, Pennsylvania, which uh, exceeds the national crime statistics averages, you'll find a company called Bill's Khakis. And um, you go to Nordstrom's and you're going to find Bill's khakis is one of the top selling khakis among, among baby boomers because they've figured out how to build uh, waistlines for uh, baby boomers where Levi's and the others don't necessarily uh, fit. IEDC is, uh, is trying to lead the way with a number of our members in terms of helping uh, to, for communities to understand better how to approach this whole issue of uh, entrepreneurship. Um, we're trying, to, uh, we did a, uh, a, a program on 40 years of understanding urban economic development in October. And we took people who had run programs in Chicago and Philadelphia, Detroit, uh, Boston, New York City, uh, when the riots hit 40 years ago. And they, we asked them to tell us what the lessons learned that they've learned in the 40 years in economic development. And they said we need to build capacity in cities for entrepreneurship development. Um, they kind of followed some of uh, uh, what Michael Porter has been suggesting in terms of his, his initiative for competitive inner cities. And uh, he has coming up in April uh, an awards program where they will uh, uh, recognize companies like this bill, Khakis, and, and Reading, Pennsylvania. I think Bill was actually uh, recognized by ICIC in the past. Um, another conclusion by our folks was to establish a national program to stimulate entrepreneurship, especially technology-oriented entrepreneurs, and provide services to entrepreneurs, especially uh, venture capital. Uh, we also um, have suggested that uh, we need to do a better job of training youth towards entrepreneurship and uh, helps communities deal with technology and technology transfer. Next week, I'm going to be with Bob Lighton and, and some of his uh, uh, colleagues at the Kauffman Foundation, and we are actually invited in at Bob's request about 30 or 35 economic developers and entrepreneurship development organizations, and we're trying to learn what is the best or better practice in supporting entrepreneurship programs around the country? We're bringing in about half entrepreneurship development uh, directors, and we're bringing in about half uh, city economic development directors. And we're trying to see if there is 
uh, some lessons to be learned in terms of these model organizations. Is there a particular type of person who is good at, um, at growing entrepreneurship uh, activity in their community? Is there a particular funding level? Are there, are there particular types of programs? Are there particular types of relationships uh, that need to exist between the economic development agencies and the entrepreneurship development programs in order to make those communities tick? Um, and the last, um, last thing I would add after just having been in New Orleans last week, you know, part of the issue, and I think Ed said this quite well, is as city economic developers, as oftentimes we are regulatory bound, we, are, uh, we have our own bureaucracies to deal with, we need to make our cities transparent and we need to make them easy to do business with and sometimes get out of the way. It's when we create bottlenecks for entrepreneurs that we make it impossible um, for the local economy to grow in quite the ways that we want it to. And um, I think that more than anything else, if we can just have simplized, more simple systems, excuse me, uh, to work through, we might be able to generate a lot more activity. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Let's uh, um, ask folks to submit their uh, questions and uh, I'll eventually we'll create a chat room with these questions. Uh, for now, we're kind of sorting through the ones that have uh, come in here. Um, uh, let's uh, get through these. Ed, let's go back. I've got several questions here, but would you go back and distinguish um, uh, what conditions a city might create and, and contrast that with Richard Florida's uh, creative classes uh, a little bit more. Many cities have followed Richard's interesting thoughts and, and uh, um, I understand that and I think the questions understand the distinction you drew but as it relates to policy, how would that play out? Sure. Uh, I, I think the uh, again just to just to make it clear where where Richard and I agree and where we disagree. Um, I think he shares my my view that it's really about attracting entrepreneurial people uh, rather than trying to do entrepreneurship yourself. So I think we're exactly on the same uh, wavelength on that. Uh, I think where we differ is is in our focus on who are entrepreneurial people and what do they what do they look like. And who are you know skilled entrepreneurial creative people, and um, I think really the, the you know the best way to think about this is just you know think about if you're you know if you're Minneapolis or if you're Boston, um, who is it that's really critical for you to try and attract, and is it a you know is it a 28 year old uh, artist or is it a 40 year old uh, biomedical researcher, and if it's a 40-year-old biomedical researcher, which is what I tend to think the sort of key key group is, although it's obviously much larger than that, that pushes you in a different direction when you think about quality of life policies than if it's a 28-year-old artist. Um, in particular, pushes you towards, uh, unfortunately, in some sense for localities, it pushes you back towards the hard basics of city government. That you know you're not going to get that you know. 40-something couple by having a couple of fun coffee houses downtown. It's really got, got to be about the, the basics of good schools, the safe streets, and fast commutes, rather than about you know a hip, fun downtown. Now, when it comes to actual, you know, uh, you know, much of Richard's advice focuses on doing things like getting rid of land use regulations which restrict the ability to create mixed income developments downtown or restrict the ability of new restaurants to, to form. Uh, I, I certainly agree with him on that. I mean, I think you know, getting, getting rid of the barriers that make uh, downtowns more fun is, is uh, certainly appropriate. Uh, I also agree with him that you know, when it's cheap, um, you know, good public art, things that increase uh, local aesthetics, that's also the good. It's hard to imagine where there would be a downside on that. Assuming that it is cheap and assuming that it doesn't distract Cities from the hard business of fixing their school systems uh, or getting their commutes, uh, getting their commutes down. So I think that's really the you know I, I sort of see it as being a nice sideline. I think Richard Richard see it meaning 
you know, uh, strategies towards hip downtowns and, and public art as being sort of a nice sideline. I think Richard sees this more as the main act. Um, and um, and I, I think I see I see the main act as, as what is it that actually you know inspires highly skilled people to be there. And I think you know uh, Boulder is a little bit of a daunting you know uh, is a little bit of a daunting uh, role model, uh, as indeed is Silicon Valley, right, which has incredibly natural uh, public amenities uh, coming from its climate uh, at the start, which make it a you know just a, a very natural place for some of the richest people on the planet to want to live. Um, but you know, Minneapolis is also a big success uh, in terms of being a consumer city for relatively skilled people. Uh, so is Boston. Uh, th there are there are a number of places that have managed, despite you know climactic disadvantages, to be attractive places where skilled people want to live as well as uh, as well as work, and they they've done it uh, often through through excellent school systems. Um, uh, but also through other basic uh, basic public policies as, as well. So, um, you know, yes, you, it may not be possible for you know every city to to beat out Boulder in the quality of life sweepstakes. But there's always a margin on which you can work, and nothing ensures that you will have you know fewer skilled, uh, successful entrepreneurs than having a place that really is very unpleasant to live in. There's uh, a number of people seem. Evidently, they believe what you all are saying because I have lots of questions about how to implement it. So let me, let me do this and uh, maybe address a question. I'm trying to combine some of these questions first to uh, Bob and then to Jeff. So we've got a series of questions about both culture and regula regulations. So let me ask the cultural questions to Bob and the regulatory questions perhaps to Jeff. So. Um, uh, how do we address cultural barriers to entrepreneurship? Who's looking at this? Are organizations exploring this? And we're working with state government to create a more entrepreneurial state culture. Any thoughts about examples or suggestions that we should look at? Uh, this is Bob. Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll take a stab at both of those. Um, you know, and I'd be happy to have Jeff and, and Edway on the culture. There are a number of studies which show that, yes, culture matters. Um, but I'm not sure we understand enough how to, you know, what levers you pull to automatically, you know, create a culture. Um, uh, you know, uh, and so you can sort of, I mean, you know it's self-reinforcing. Once, once you get a few companies that start, there gets to be a culture, let's say, of angel capital. The rich guys get together. They form, um, they form an angel ca capital group. They finance other people, and you're off on a, on a virtuous cycle. But if you ask, well, how do you start that from ground zero? I'm not sure I have the, I have the magic answer. Um, uh, I mean, you can of course create, um, you know, all kinds of opportunities to meet. You can, uh, you can encourage the local chamber of commerce to do all that stuff and so forth. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure anybody has a magic, magic recipe. Now, on the issue of regulation, I want to say this is something where Ed and Jeff and I all agree. Um, and uh, there are at least a couple approaches I would recommend for cities to look at. Um, in the age of the web, the obvious thing is um, the more you can make your city website a home for uh, uh, regulatory approvals and, regu and, and, and license applications, one-stop shop place, the better off you'll be. And one of the things our urban specialist said is the worst enemy to entrepreneurship is that delay when they apply for a, you know, a zoning approval or a, a building permit or whatever. You ought to have a hard and fast rule in the city that you know, whatever decision is or whatever application is made, you want a decision up or down within 30 days or less. So anything you can do to speed decision making and make it easier for people, web and also real life. I'll give you one example. I mean, here in Kansas City is not a model. I mean, if you if you want to open a restaurant in Kansas City, you probably have to go to a number of different places and different offices. Um, I've been down to San Antonio and um, in a unique venture for what I understand where the Chamber of Commerce there worked with the local city, they put all their regulatory offices in one building. So that you could literally, whether let's say you're going to be in the construction business or the restaurant business or whatever, you could walk in sort of like the driver's license bureau, say, hey, I want to open a, a restaurant. The person at the at the front would tell you, well, you need to see booths number one, five, and seven, and you could get all your approvals in one day. Um, and so, uh, 
that model, whether it's physical or virtual, is something that it seems, I mean, it sounds easy, but it's not. For those of you in the cities, you know how, how turf-ridden cities are and everything else, but God, if you could, do, if you could pull that off, that's one, of the, that's one of the most dramatic things you could do, I think, to send a signal that your city is, is, is open for business. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Uh, you know, uh, I'm on the Arlington County, Virginia Economic Development Commission. And we have spent an inordinate amount of time over the last year, year and a half, uh, trying to get our permit process uh, to a point where we were the envy of our uh, competitive communities. And I will tell you that we have done things that uh, many other cities um, can only wish that, that they have done. Many of you probably have walked into um, new hotels where you no longer have the big barrier between you and the uh, person who's registering them. They're behind some podium. We're doing podiums um, in the Arlington County uh, Regulation Center. Uh, the person is supposed to walk out from behind the counter and take people um, to the next stop. Uh, they are to be more like your neighborhood hardware store uh, than they are your neighborhood regulatory center. And I think when we start thinking uh, of like that on a regular basis, we're going to be a lot more successful. Um, now that's, that's the city um, or, or the government side of the culture. <clears throat> I always worried about my hometown in terms of whether it was a place of entrepreneurship culture. Uh, because I came from a place that was blue collar, it had large paternalistic um, companies who employed everybody. There wasn't a great entrepreneurship um, uh, history there. But I also found there was nothing like a great layoff that all of a sudden created a lot of entrepreneurship uh, within that community. Uh, we saw a number of big companies go down, and the next thing we know, we ended up having a bunch of of um, of, of a number of entrepreneurs grow. Um, I'm not sure what the entrepreneurship culture is in a place like um, I grew up in Newark, Ohio. Uh, but it was funny when you did have some of these bigger companies go down, uh, you did have a tremendous growth. We were not a rich community, so, and we were not one with necessarily a, a system of higher education that made us a natural place, but I could point out to some fast-growing businesses in that community. So we have a, one set of questions about culture and another set of questions about regulation. So, and, then we, and we have, a, uh, as you just touched on a second ago, it seems a different set of questions about um, kind of effective and efficient government. Um, uh, uh, let me just ask any of the three speakers just to kind of go back to culture for a second. And just let me ask a question. Are we assuming in this conversation that entrepreneurship equals the knowledge industry like that? that what, what if uh, does it fit in your model if a city wants to be entrepreneurial in the tool and dye industry or do they need to be only entrepreneurial into uh, biogenetics? No, of course, of course not. I'm sorry about that. You do it. Or Jeff, you were. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio has a proud history of the tool and die industry. Dayton, Ohio uh, has a big history in the tool and die world as well, and they tried to actually uh, create a thing called Tool Town. I think people are going to, uh, I think we're going to have a number of uh, successful entrepreneurs even taking on cheap manufacturing that we're going to come in from uh, the Far East. I mean, this uh, example that I gave of Bill's khakis, you know, who would have thought that we were going to, somebody could compete successfully in, in, in making garments? Right. I, I was just going to add that I, I also don't, you know, in no sense do we need to suggest that this is just about the knowledge economy. But even in sectors of the economy that are not uh, things that we think of as being about high technology, skills continue to be really important. Right, that it, whether or not it's you know tool and die or, or garment, uh, the garment trade, uh, the, the the bedrock of the most successful entrepreneurs still tend to be uh, 
uh, highly skilled, uh, highly skilled, or at least reasonably well-educated, uh, educated people. I should say that the more that you're pushed, by the way, also towards tool and die people, the more that you're pushed away from thinking that having cool downtowns is the answer. Right? I think that's sort of the, uh, the average tool and die entrepreneur is even being less prone to thinking that coffee houses are the critical amenity uh, for uh, choosing uh, his or her uh, his or her city. Just the thing about culture. Um, I think we all. Uh, you know, all believe that culture matters, but it is. I want to join with with Jeff in saying that thinking that it is, you know, the crucial element, and either you got it or you don't, is surely a mistake. In some sense, you can think about it as being, you know, either something that's that's a bit of a help or a bit of a hindrance, um, but you can also think about it as something that creates a, a local multiplier effect where if you can get the local entrepreneurship going by attracting the right people and getting out of their way, uh, then they will create a culture of entrepreneurship that actually that, that then forms around an initial, uh, an initial uh, set of uh, innovators. So I mean, I wouldn't think of this as being something that's an insuperable uh, barrier, but rather something that you know, can change readily as human beings adapt readily to new uh, circumstances. Uh, and let me also just echo my enormous enthusiasm for, the, for both Bob and, and the, the audience uh, and the other a discussion of, of fast permitting. Uh, I just see this as being a, a complete win-win situation. That actually having limits on the time uh, involved in, in permitting projects seems seems absolutely vital, uh, and one where where there's just no, you know, I just don't see the downside of restricting to a reasonable time period uh, the approval uh, the approval time for whether it's a new business or a new building project. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous that it takes seven years to get building projects through uh, the regulatory hurdles in lots of uh, areas of this country. And, and I can think of no better way to ensure that entrepreneurs or, or you know, any sort of uh, smart businessmen would move other, uh, elsewhere. And, and the terrible thing about these delays is it's not like they do anyone any good, but I mean, it's not like it's not like the community is helped by having a lengthy delay process. Uh, they may be helped by having some regulations in place, although in most cases the fewer the better. But just dragging out the process is nothing does nothing but harm. Uh, now this is Bob again. I want to weigh on just a couple more insights. Um, one is I think Jeff mentioned the issue of layoffs, um, and he's certainly right um, uh, that you tend to get in pockets of, of, of areas that have had layoffs, you get a, a bump up in entrepreneurship. Although of course you don't see that nationally. Nationally, the entrepreneurship rate tends to be pretty stable and is not cyclical. But um, in connection with layoffs, uh, Kaufman has a program called Fast Track. And if you Google Fast Track, F A S T and then T R A C, Fast Track, you'll see it's a course that's basically a six week course for new entrepreneurs. And uh, it's a free curriculum that Kaufman offers. And it's offered at roughly 270 locations around the country. Uh, and you can contact um, uh, you can contact Kaufman if you need to get access to it, um, and it's for newbies. Um, but um, uh, you know, it's it, it's it gives you enough information to get started. And we've had a number of businesses here in Kansas City with Sprint having layoffs, where people have gone through the course and have started. So that's one thing you can do locally. And the second thing I'll tell you, you can do. This is not something like a, I'm advocating that the mayor has an affirmative program, but this is a thing where a mayor can call his or her friends and establish an active mentorship program. We have a number of them in Kansas City where um, not new businesses necessarily get mentored, but if you've been in business for you know, a certain period of time, you have a certain degree of revenue. We have a number of very successful entrepreneurs who have established mentor programs. And what you can do is establish networks of successful um, uh, business people who, all, who have a a strong allegiance to their city. They don't want to see it go down. Uh, and this is something where if you establish a network, you can actually build a culture. Um, I can't prove it empirically will make sense. All I see is with my eyes here in Kansas City and a number of other places where people have mentorship programs. This is something that can work. It can help struggling businesses get over the hump. Um, and just as equally important, it can discourage some people who may want to start a business from even starting and then mortgaging their home and losing everything they have. Bob, I want to. Uh, there's a couple of questions to Jeff about his summer, but let me just ask you one. Um, I want to take a question and then kind of wrap it in my own provocation here for a second, uh, just to follow up to you. So, you know, in the, uh, in the book where you contrasted entrepreneurship uh, around the world, country to country, I was uh, kind of impressed. I'm going to get the words wrong, but kind of looking at kind of corporate statist relationships and entrepreneurial organizations and. 
it, it, just going back to my time as mayor, there's an awful lot of uh, vested interests, and I don't even mean that in an inappropriate way in cities where there are professional barriers to entry and there are large corporations that demand subsidies, and, and there is a lot of investment in um, traditional and in-place corporations, and, and they, they may be you know, trade protections, they may be corporate protections, but, but they're there. So uh, talk to us just for a second about how, this, uh, how you think through this entrepreneurship being different than just subsidies for uh, traditional uh, or in-place corporations or professions, because those can easily collide in the, in the face of the economic development director. Well, you're absolutely right. The book you're referring to actually is a book called Good Capitalism, Bad Capitalism, which I'm a co-author uh, with uh, William Baumel and also Carl Schramm, and we survey the different kinds of capitalism around the world, and what Steve is referring to is, is, is something called uh, uh, big firm or managerial capitalism that is practiced uh, throughout the world, but it's certainly in very, in, it's very significant in pockets of the United States where you get towns that are, that are dominated by the big firms that he, talk, that he talks about. Um, one of the virtues of what we call entrepreneurial capitalism, in contrast, is if you think about the so-called radical innovations that have really transformed our economy, they historically have tended to come uh, through entrepreneurs, not through established firms, not through big firms. And I think this gets to the importance of something that Ed talked about, the importance of non-compete clauses. Um, because uh, there is a literature that says that one of the reasons for California's success is they do not enforce uh, long uh, non-compete clauses, and that allows people to move out of big company X into their own new company. And another thing that Ed said is that if you look at the age group of people that tend to form businesses and that are most successful, they are the 35 to 45 year old people. They, and they typically are in businesses that they already were working for. They leave an existing employer, they see a particular market niche that isn't being exploited or an idea that's not being exploited, and they go form it on their own. A perfect example here, I'm going to cite in Kansas City, many of you probably know the GPS systems that are now sold by Garmin Industries and are virtually in every car in America now that are, that, that are made or around the world. Garmin was started by two engineers who were with Allied Signal in 1989, and Allied Signal basically wouldn't let them go into the GPS business. And so they left, and the rest is history, and now they, got the multi, now they have a multi-billion dollar company. Um, and so you see that again and again. Large entrepreneurial companies that try to keep their employees will not let them go out um, and compete. This is one of the worst enemies of entrepreneurship. Uh, and so um, I'm just reinforcing essentially what you said, Steve, that, that big firms can actually be the enemy of entrepreneurial growth because they don't want the competition or they think they know all the answers. Steve, was the United Airlines deal done while you were mayor? <laughs> Oh, such an unkind uh, question. Uh, for the other 100 people on the call, this is, uh, I was a mayor of Indianapolis in the uh, 90s, and the day I was elected, not the day I took office, but the day I was elected, the city and state signed a uh, very lucrative enticement for uh, United Airlines to bring a huge man uh, maintenance hub to Indianapolis. Um, I had some anxiety about that. Um, we went forward, and as most people on the phone know who follow these things, United closed it up and left the city with the debt. So um, I presided over it, but refused to take total blame for the situation. Well, I, I, I wasn't. Uh, I, I wanted to know how I should tread on that question. Um, I've I've given a lot of presentations on the whole issue of incentives, and I've generally argued that they are. Um, they're certainly fair to the people who extract them, but they are unfair to the local businesses because at the end of the day, where we like to believe these uh, big incentives don't have costs, they do have costs. Uh, we're educating probably a larger uh, group of people that may move or relocate. Uh, we end up having to provide police and fire services, and then it sounds to me, and I haven't kept up with the United Airlines deal, uh, that you know, the, you now have a, a hole in your community which you've provided uh, some type of incentive for. And we don't end up providing those same level of incentives to um, uh, local entrepreneurial businesses. We, uh, we, we may try to make life easier for them. We may have some capital access programs for them. We may support a small business development center to, uh, to help them grow. Uh, but clearly the amount of money that we throw in most places 
to support an entrepreneurship program as a pittance compared to some of these big incentives. Um, okay, let me. Uh, we've got uh, lots of questions here, and I'll just throw them out, and you all can take turns answering answering them. Um, uh, question: uh, We're looking at entrepreneurship not just as economic development, but workforce development. We focus on high tech and view micro enterprises being essential to the quality of life needed to attract knowledge workers. And entrepreneurship across the spectrum is valuable to our state. Um, what policies would you recommend that are consistent with that? Workforce development is particularly the issue. How do you? How do, is this part and parcel of entrepreneurship? Let me just kind of a, a note and say uh, it, it's difficult to find very many workforce uh, programs that actually make a difference. So, have any of the three of you found ones that are consistent? You know, I, I would like to ask Bob a question. Um, I've always been suspicious of the micro entrepreneurship programs that take the poorest people and try to bring them into a job when Ed's um, uh, slides talk about uh, people uh, with education and, and uh, supposedly uh, resources um, and how they go forward. Bob, are you finding any, any real examples or good examples where we take the poorest to the poor and put them into uh, entrepreneurship versus jobs? Well, um, uh, two points. Uh, one is there is a section of our book on good capitalism and bad capitalism where we had sort of one tier for microenterprise, but not certainly two or three tiers. And the, the basic problem is that it doesn't scale. Um, I mean, if you really want to scale things, you want, you want fast-growing businesses. And um, um, just subsidizing lots of people who are doing um, uh, essentially mom-and-pop uh, operations at barely above minimum wage is not going to grow your city. So that's point one. Now, on Steve's point about workforce development, you really hit a, 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 a sensitive button that's here, a struggle, that we're struggling with here in Kansas City. People don't know this, but I think Kansas City is either the third or fourth largest per capita in the United States in engineers. Uh, we have some very large engineering companies here. Um, and a lot of leading employers came to us here in Kaufman about a year ago, and they said, you know, with the graying of the baby boomers in about seven or eight years, um, uh, we're going to lose about half our workforce. And by the way, I don't think we're unique. This is happening all over America, uh, where experienced uh, people that have engineering talent are retiring. And they said, you know, our schools, uh, they are, you know, we have rotten math and science scores, and a lot of the kids who are not going to go to college, who otherwise we would hire, um, they just, you know, they have suboptimal skills, to put it mildly. And so we are embarked here in Kansas City on a major program trying to upgrade the math and science skills of, uh, of kids that are going to school, especially in, in urban areas, so that they can qualify for some of these jobs because it doesn't do any good to start an entrepreneurial business if you have no employees. So yes, work for, workforce is, the, is related to this, but it goes back to Ed's point that your schools have got to be, have got to be decent. And one of the programs we've imported here in Kansas City, I don't know if it's a silver bullet, but so those of you around the country should investigate it, it's called Project Lead the Way. It was actually started in New York, and I think it's now in 45 or 50 states. And what it is, it's, a, um, it's, an, it's an engineering sort of minor that you can take in high school um, that's very practically oriented. It's sort of the 21st century equivalent of shop. And shop courses don't exist anymore, as we know. But what this does is applies sort of, uh, you know, your basic uh, chemistry, um, uh, physics, and so forth in a much more practical way. And the kids that are in these programs are mixtures between kids who would go to MIT and kids who would ordinarily go to shops. Some who are good with their hands, some that are good with their minds. And this program, from what we can tell, it's been in process for about 10 years, has been rather successful in motivating kids to be more interested in science and math. And at least the kids who are coming out that don't go to college can end up working for your typical tool and die company and won't have to be retaught math all over again. So I urge you to at least look into this. It's on the web. Go look for Project Lead the Way. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at some of the other questions that are here as we go forward. Um, uh, let's see. There's a, there's a uh, question from Ohio, which gets beat up a little bit here. Ohio has a model entrepreneurship program through the fr Third Frontier, which is the title of its program for several years now, known as ESP. The program links capital, operational assistance, and purchase services to entrepreneurs. 
we are linking the six programs. I guess those are the six programs referenced. How do we link to other states and regions? I think this is probably asked a couple of different times by other questionnaires, which is we're looking at these issues at a regional level. What regions do you think are doing this well? Anybody? Jeff? That's a Jeff. Well, I, you know, I think um, if people can give me six to eight weeks, um, <laughs> Yes, we are, we're going to have some interesting answers, and this goes to something else you were going to ask me, Steve. Uh, we're going to have some type of written report based on um, the results of our meeting next week in Kansas City. Um, and we'll, um, in fact, uh, if uh, you guys have a list of attendees to this meeting and their email addresses, um, with Bob Lighton's permission, we'll just go ahead and send everybody a copy of yeah. of our report or, or summary of what we do next Tuesday. And we may well get some best in class or better in class regions. Uh, we certainly will get uh, a lot of information on what good programs look like. Okay. Um, here's a, actually a really interesting kind of niche question from Baltimore. I'll ask it. Yeah, I, uh, not under any hopes that anybody can answer it, but I think it's really kind of a fun question. Is there an example of a city government that has spun off an entrepreneurial type organization? Uh, we, the Parking Authority of Baltimore City, which by the way has a reputation of being a, a really good authority, is attempting to help incubate a nonprofit car sharing organization separate financially and organizationally, but its mission would be in line with ours. Any recommendations that we, as a quasi-city government agency, can do to help ensure its success? Let me just, while you all think of the right answer, let me just make an observation about this. Um, it, I uh, do believe that government, um, this goes back to my kind of public-private partnership privatization days, that government can think of its uh, purchasing power as a way to provide a steady um, uh, a source of capital to an entrepreneurial organization. So, for example, uh, we took our sign shop, and the, the men and women running the sign shop for the city wanted to go into the sign shop business. This is not directly applicable to obviously the parking, but but our contract with them to take that essentially they did their own little LBO and took it out, but they took it out with a three-year contract from us, which allowed them to leverage that when the wastewater treatment plant was sold. Uh, uh, an entrepreneurial minority-owned organization wanted to go in and expand its uh, chemical sales business and its, its, uh, its, its three-year contract with that, or with that large purchaser, meaning government purchaser of chemicals, allowed it then to leverage a kind of a Midwest footprint. So the same obviously is true in not-for-profit. So government could be a smart buyer here. I used to ask the uh, local university doing kind of meds and eds economic development to not only think about how it educated, but how it purchased. So now that I've stalled for three minutes, did any of you have to nominate somebody for the Baltimore Parking Authority to look at for uh, its creative nonprofit car uh, uh, pooling? If not, I'll in invite others to uh, add that to the chat room. It's a really fun question. Um, next question. Um, this is a question from cold cities, and we have uh, a number of obviously Midwestern, Northeastern folks on the on the phone. Among the cold cities that have successfully developed economies conducive to entrepreneurial growth and development, are there factors that have distinguished those who have succeeded from those who haven't? Are there distinguishing factors in terms of policies that have attracted educated young people and the like? Any comments from any of the three of you? Well, I mean, they, the I mean, the the point of the first graph was just that the, the single variable that you know explains cold cold uh, success is, is skilled people, and I think that that actually that variable works both through the straight economy in the sense that you have a, a steady supply of potential skilled entrepreneurs, but I think it also uh, works through the quality of government. Uh, one of the things that, that is interesting, and it's true both across states within the U.S. And, and across the world, is that education is tightly linked to the quality of government. If you actually look at corruption across U.S. states as measured by federal government uh, convictions for corruption uh, offenses, they're very strongly negatively associated with education. 
uh, at the at the uh, at the state level. Um, and and of course the same thing is true at the, at the national uh, at the national level. That actually more educated people tend to be better at getting uh, uh, at getting government uh, to do the right things at the at the local level. What what you often see is that less educated places devolve into uh, you know difficult. Uh, uh, what's the right word? Uh, politics of conflict rather than recognizing that localities really are are you know. Small enough areas that you know there there are a limited number of things that localities can really do, and this is not you know this is not a place to solve the problems of the world. It's a place to make sure your your snow is being cleared away quickly. Um, so I think that that's um, that's certainly part of the you know, part of the, the main thing that's part of the the defining success in the in, in the colder places. Um, you know, I, I tend to think that sort of the most that that's really the most important political step that's happened in the colder places is the move from the sort of you know very hopeful but ultimately not very efficient uh, politics of the Lindsay era towards uh, let's call it the era of Goldsmith to be uh, particularly uh, uh, flattering towards towards our mayor but uh, but it's it's the it's the city it's the city mayors who saw their jobs as actually being about efficient delivery of services rather than about being something that was sort of on a much grander or uh, a more exalted scale and I think actually it's this movement towards City manager type mayors that that really has distinguished those colder cities that have done well. Picking up that snow off the ground. Um, any other comments on cold city strategies, Jeff or Bob? Before we move on to the next question. Steve, I would point people to two uh, recent publications. Um, one uh, is just uh, it's just come out, and it's called um, Retooling for Growth. Uh, it's by Richard McGahey and Jennifer Bay, um, and it's, uh, it's an American Assembly book. And it's frankly looking at uh, economically distressed cities, which many of our cold cities are. Uh, Bob, do you have a chapter in this? Um, I gave the opening address, but I'm not sure if it was written up. Um, I, think, um, I think it's on the American Assembly website, I think. Yeah, the, and the second, now there is one book, and this is by McGahey and, and Bay. The second is, um, uh, a, it's also called Retooling for Growth, and it's the 106th American Assembly, um, and it's building, a, uh, it's all, it has almost the same title. It's a shor shorter book that focuses on how do you improve places with a series of recommendations. And uh, that one can be downloaded from the American Assembly website. So, and there's entrepreneurship strategies in both of these documents. I can see that Jim is frantically trying to keep up with your references in his uh, Google searching here on the line. <laughs> right, um, sorry, Jim. Uh, let Jim, uh, you're, you're too slow, Jim. You have to hurry it up. We're, we're, we're going to move on here. Uh, we've got a couple uh, sets of questions here, and uh, uh, one's from uh, uh, Phil Singerman, who many of you know is, uh, uh, was a federal official, very astute in these areas, and a couple of similar questions. And they basically deal with the role of universities. So, um, uh, and there's a package of questions. Some deal with university-related science and research parks. Some deal with funding uh, kind of eminent scholars to come to your local university. Some deal with uh, getting federal dollars into your local university. There was an article yesterday, either New York Times or Washington Post, about the large number of earmarks for these things. Um, would any of the three of you take any part? Well, I think maybe each of the three of you would take a part of the town gown issue here as part of entrepreneurship. I think it's, there's lots of questions and lots of interest. Yeah, this is Jeff. I will take a shot at it in a different way than the three uh, statements you just made. Uh, one of the people that is on the uh, uh, that's listening in today is Mark Weinberg. Uh, Mark uh, runs the Voinovich Center at Ohio University, and it's an entrepreneurship support program, and it's frankly one of the better ones in the country. Um, one of the requirements at the university, and it's in southeastern Ohio. I will confess that's also my alma mater, uh, but. Um, uh, they, uh, one of the requirements of the uh, if you get an MBA at Ohio University is you have to actually work in the Boinovich Center uh, supporting local entrepreneurs and going on site and providing technical assistance. Uh, the National Business Incubation Association is also headquartered at Ohio University. They uh, have a successful business incubator in their own right. So there are activities um, um, much beyond 
uh, kind of this tech, uh, technology-led economic development strategy, but universities can also do a lot to support entrepreneurship development. Ed, you want to weigh in, and then I can I can follow. Why not? Uh, the, uh, the the I mean, universities there is a there is a strong empirical track record of innovations coming out of universities, and there's, there's a patent. Uh, track record of, of private sector patents borrowing from local universities. So it's certainly it's certainly true that the universities have the ability to be you know helpful uh, engines of growth. That being said, act outright local investment uh, of uh, significant dollars in, in universities is is likely to be a very expensive strategy uh, where most of the benefits will be reaped at the regional or, or national or global level. Uh, rather than at the local level, so uh, I tend to think if you're going to talk about actually dollars being spent, you know, the, probably the best dollars being spent are at the lower levels of, of education, where you're more likely to, um, you know, uh, keep keep the, the product of, of education. You're also likely to attract parents who want the kids to be better educated. That being said, I think there's a lot that you know smart localities can do to collaborate with with universities. Uh, as long as they recognize that you know the right the right answer is not giving money to the universities, but trying to nudge those universities into being collaborators in the product of uh, in the process of economic uh, growth. And I would say actually the thing that localities of course have to give to universities is is an easier regulatory environment. Uh, as as always, we come back to that. But certainly, you know. Um, the, the experience that I've, I've had with Harvard certainly suggests the enormous uh, power that localities have over universities by making, um, with their control over over land use regulation and other other regulatory decisions, and, and because of that power, uh, they have considerable ability to nudge universities in particular directions. So I think nudging those universities towards being partners and creating more entrepreneurship, which means you know, uh, collaborating with the marketplace, making sure that they're uh, university departments that oversee private sector entrepreneurship among their academics uh, are in good shape, uh, working for better collaboration between city agencies and, and uh, university-based entrepreneurs. That's, that's certainly all to the good, and I think that's really the right, right way to view, uh, view universities. In some sense, the right way to view them is, is in the same sense that you would any sort of large employer that's a prospective partner, right? It's not that you want to directly fund them. It's not that you want to pick winners or losers. But you do want to have those challenges of, of you know, those those channels of communication open, uh, and you do want to nudge them towards ways that are more accommodating of growth. Especially since the universities are really, in some sense, more akin to you know guilds of prospective entrepreneurs than they are to traditional large corporations. Uh, and because of that sort of guild of prospective entrepreneurs aspect to them, they can be really very fertile fields for entrepreneurial development. Yeah, and then I'll add to just a couple more things because I knew Ed was going to get the plug in about getting rid of uh, regulatory delays for universities to build things. I think universities are, are potential homes for entrepreneurship uh, or entrepreneurship training programs, the kind of fast track kind of things that I was talking about. Although I would caution, I would not have most of the faculty be university faculty. Because uh, as Ed will know, very few um, university professors um, have ever founded a business. And when the kind of people you want teaching those programs are other entrepreneurs. Uh, but universities can be good physical homes of those places. That's point one. Uh, point two, there is a literature which we have helped pay for, which does show that trying to attract star scientists is actually something that will promote growth. The problem is, is it can cost you a ton of money to try to attract that super scientist, especially if it's to a cold weather place. And number two, that's just another form of smokestack chasing. Because you can get star scientist X, you may buy that person for four or five years, and then somebody else will buy them. Um, and so it's not a long-term strategy, even though it may, sure, it may show up in the short-run data. Right. I would say the right the right government strategy towards superstar scientists is if it's helpful for the mayor to have a cup of coffee with him to show him how much he cares. That's fine, but I wouldn't be I wouldn't be spending much money on it. I mean, that suggests that the mayor's time is valueless. Is that the point of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe it's somewhat somewhat lower down. It's, uh, well, it depends on how small the city and how much the uh, star the scientist is. All right, all right, okay. Um, and the mayor may and the mayor may learn something for the star scientist. Steve. It's not it's not unheard of. Okay, all right. I accept that. Uh, we have a few more questions here. Um, uh, a couple questions about fast track. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's 
free? Is there an online version of Fast Track for areas without physical training sites? Um, just a, a word or two more about Fast Track here. Okay, so the best the best thing to do if you want information about Fast Track is to email Stephanie Weaver. It's just S Weaver W E A V E R at Kaufman dot org. Um, say you were on a you know a conference call about cities and you heard about Fast Track programs and you want to know as much information as you can and she will give you everything you need to know. She'll tell you where the nearest place to go. Uh, we give away the curriculum. Um, uh, uh, She'll tell you everything you need to know. Okay. Um, traditional. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just going to add one other thing about universities. It's very important to know. There's this myth out there that um, you know you're you're not going to be successful locality unless you have a strong local university. A lot of people believe that. All right. And so one of the examples, I think, counter examples we point to in the in the paper is Seattle. If you think about uh, Seattle's actually the, the home of some incredible entrepreneurial successes, not just Microsoft, but Costco, you know, Amazon. Um, I'm, I'm leaving out two or three more. Uh, which one? Starbucks. Oh, yeah, Starbucks. Okay. None of those companies came out of University of Washington. All right? Um, I mean, University of Washington's benefited by the fact that you've got all these rich people giving money to the university and you've got a, a talent pool, but it just shows that you can have an entrepreneurial city without having a Stanford or MIT or Ohio State or name any, 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 any other school you want. So um, uh, don't, don't feel pessimistic just because you don't have a strong local university. Okay. Um, let's do, I'm going to ask uh, one more question then ask you all to kind of close with uh, comments and then we'll, we'll take the rest of the questions that really cover some of the same areas and create the uh, chat site. Um, the, uh, uh, anybody have any uh, good models for uh, a rural America? A traditional, this question says, traditional venture capital models not really address the reality of emerging entrepreneurship. If we did, we'd have no access to capital issues needing solutions. Can anyone point to interesting non-traditional venture capital models that are working in rural America? That's a tough question. God, you know what, Steve, that's not the only time we've gotten that question. It's a very good question. I have no idea. Very good question, and our document really is focused on urban areas, and um, I think it's something that says that we've got a, we've got more homework to do uh, for rural. There are people that study this. I mean, if you Google rural entrepreneurship, you're going to find a, a guy at the University of Missouri who knows a lot about it, whose name escapes me right now. Um, uh, but not a lot's written on it. Oh, and by the way, there's another place you can go on the web. The Kansas City, the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, has a number of publications on on rural economic development. Um, so you can find out information there. Okay. Um, I, I actually have an example, and, and um, hopefully, you know, I was extolling the virtues of Ohio University here a few minutes ago. Once this, um, once we open up the uh, website to uh, more information, maybe Mark Weinberg uh, could, could provide us um, uh, information on the uh, venture capital program that they have going down there. They have a guy by the name of, um, if I remember correctly, uh, David Wilhelm, who has created a venture capital program. It was one of the early new markets tax credit programs, if I remember correctly. And uh, they are doing a lot of, um, of venture capital in rural southeastern Ohio. And Mark might be able to provide some of that when you do open up for uh, some online dialogue. Okay. Well, then. Um if we could, uh, how about just a, a, a one or two minute um, summary of important points that you've heard in the conversation from the three presenters, and then Jim, I'm going to ask you to close a little information about where to get the archive and how to access the chat room. Uh, let's go in the same order we opened in, so um, uh, Bob. Well, I'm not going to repeat the things I've said before, but I want to, I want to underscore what Jeff has said. We are having this conference next week. Um, and I'm hopeful that we're going to have um, some very interesting work product that will come out of that. There may be even further events that we will um, enlarge the group. Um, and so some of the people that are on this call may be part of another effort. We, we actually don't know what we're going to do. It's the first time I think we've got people like this to meet just to exchange information. Um, and this is sort of like uh, uncharted territory. To what extent can we actually uh, promote entrepreneurial uh, growth? Uh, through these model programs, um, uh, and um, it's an important question we want to have answered. Uh, Ed? 
you know, in, in some sense, the great paradox of uh, the urban world today is despite the decline in communication and transportation costs that have made the world flat, that cities are more vital than ever. And I think the reason why cities are more vital is that urban density, urban proximity, uh, sets the stage for the transfer of ideas, for the creation of new innovations uh, that you know drive the economy and that, uh, that drive the, the future of the world's technology and civilization. So I think local policies towards entrepreneurship are important not just for local success, but in fact for everything. That, that in fact cities are, are really the great engines of, of the world's economies right now. And turning them into centers of innovative entrepreneurship is incredibly important, not just for, for local well-being, but for the entire world. Yeah, before I give Jeff the last word, there was a, a question at the end uh, directed towards you that came in a little bit late. It, it references your comment about universities not picking winners and losers. But, but inherently, doesn't the city and the state, when it teams up with how to fund universities, the areas and um, federal earmarks and the like, isn't that what they're doing, uh, picking winners and losers? Yeah, I think, and I think the track record on that is not great. I mean, it's, um, you know, the, the attempting to micromanage how, I think, how universities spend their money or what departments they go on is, is very, very tough. I mean, a little, bit, a little bit of a nudge is okay, but, you know, universities like companies, I think, work best when they are competitive, when they're trying new things, when they're experimenting. And, and I think that the, the top-down picking winners and losers in departments is, is not, you know, uh, is not great. That being said, there's still, you know, sort of obvious, simple, sensible things to, to do on this. But in general, I would push against that. Okay, Jeff? Well, I, I think I want to conclude in, in two ways. Uh, the first, I did find the name of the uh, Rural Venture Capital Program. Jim, I think, is going to uh, post the link at uh, Adina Adventures. And as you can see, they're doing stuff primarily in Appalachia, uh, rural Ohio, West Virginia, and uh, I assume Pennsylvania. Um, I think um, sometimes in the academic world, uh, economic developers uh, get a bad name and we're viewed as, as uh, doing more smokestack chasing than anything else. And, and I think when you look across the economic development uh, uh, field, you'll find that there are a lot more folks interested, concerned, and trying to find ways to support local entrepreneurship. Um, you know, we, we tried to provide some examples today of, of some of the lessons learned. Uh, I, we have hopefully will learn more. And I think uh, considering the outsourcing, offshoring, globalization of uh, the world economy, I think uh, it's going to become an even greater uh, role for communities and their economic development activities to focus on entrepreneurship. Um, so the folks that are online today, um, I think, are obviously those that are, are, are thinking about where their economy is going to go, and, and they're looking for better practice case studies in terms of how they can apply it back in their communities. And, and, and um, IEDC will be spending more time with it, and we appreciate being involved in this today. All right. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for your uh, insights and participation. And uh, Jim, uh, concluding technical remarks, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, what I'd like to do is just uh, open up uh, two different resources for people. Uh, the first, as you've seen me displaying, is uh, we have a resources page with some, which some of you may have uh, explored already. Um, but that's, uh, that links right off from our main event page, which you should see in front of you. And um, you can just scroll down to the resources link, and there we have links to um, the Kauffman Foundation and specifically the paper that was being discussed today. Uh, we also have a link to the IEDC and some relevant articles there. And then below that, some other articles and websites of interest, such as the uh, Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings, and uh, and then some other websites that uh, I believe were mentioned, mentioned like uh, Richard Florida's website, et cetera. And then uh, the other thing I want to call your attention to is we um, are opening up a uh, text-based chat room. And this is an opportunity for you to continue the dialogue with some other audience members. And uh, I'm going to show you how to get to that chat room in just a second. Let me pop up the um, instructions for how to get there, first of all. 
So um, this is uh, basically you'll be uh, chatting and uh, uh, submitting text back and forth uh, with other audience members, and you can share links and files in this room as well. It's very easy to use. You don't need to download any software. And um, these are the instructions, very easy, and I'm just going to um, simulate these. Um, first, you're going to want to go to our main website, the Government Innovators Network. And I'm going to go there right now. And then on the home page, at the top right, whoop, well, in a second, at the top right-hand side of your screen, you're going to see a link to um, the chat room reception. And um, I'm sorry that this isn't uh, posted already. Up oh, now, it's up there. All right, so um, you'll go to that link. What I, what what password do you use? Uh, there there is no password okay. to get into the chat room. Um, Simply click on that link at the top right screen and then uh, type in your name. Then click sign in and that should place you into our chat room. You can begin chatting with people right away. I'll be uh, there as well to provide uh, technical tips, but uh, again, I think you'll find that it's extremely easy to use. And uh, we'll, if uh, there's a lot of activity there, we'll uh, leave the room open as long as an hour. And um, if it you know, fizzles out a little earlier than that, then we can close it down early. But uh, that is uh, available to you for those of you interested. So we hope to see you there. All right. Well, with that, uh, we are adjourned. We thank everybody for their participation. Thank you. Thank you. Great.